Now speaking, John Bruno, Vice President, Investor Relations. Good morning everyone, and thank you for joining us for PPG's second quarter 2023 Financial Results Conference Call. Joining me on the call are Tim Navish, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Vince Morales, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Our comments today will relate to the financial information released after U.S. equity markets closed on Thursday, July 20, 2023. We have posted detailed commentary and accompanying presentation slides on the Investor Center of our website, ppg.com. These slides provide additional support to the opening comments I will make shortly. Following my perspective on the company's results for the quarter, we will move to a Q&A session. Please note that both the prepared commentary and discussion during this call may contain forward-looking statements, reflecting the company's current view of future events and their potential effect on PPG's operating and financial performance. These statements involve uncertainties and risks which may cause actual results to differ. The company is under no obligation to provide subsequent updates to these forward-looking statements. Additionally, the presentation also contains certain non-GAAP financial measures. The company has provided in the appendix of the presentation materials, which are available on our website, reconciliations of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures. Now speaking, Tim Navish, President and Chief Executive Officer. Thank you for joining us on our second quarter 2023 earnings call. We are pleased to report record financial performance, including sales of $4.9 billion, adjusted earnings per diluted share from continuing operations of $2.25, and year-to-date cash generation of about $620 million. Despite operating in an environment of variable global economic demand, we achieved strong growth trends in several of our technology advantage businesses and leading brands. We implemented incremental price increases in the first half of the year, primarily in the performance coding segment, and our aggregate two-year stack pricing for the company is now about 20%. We expect selling prices to remain positive in the second half of 2023. Our aggregate segment margins in Q2 were about 16%, which is 330 basis points higher than the second quarter of 2022. This included the performance coding segment, delivering margins of near 18%, the highest since 2016. We delivered record operating cash generation of about $620 million, supported by our record net earnings and lower inventory levels. We have three key drivers contributing to our excellent financial results in 2023. One, our portfolio business mix is providing great resilience. Two, strong execution of cost and margin management in Europe. And three, our strong positioning in Mexico. We have actions underway to capture further growth in our other businesses and are partnering with our customers to deliver superior service and products with a focus on enhancing their productivity and sustainability. We expect global industrial production to remain at lower levels in the third quarter, including similar demand activity in Europe, some further slowing in the US, and modest sequential improvement in China. We anticipate demand in Europe will stabilize at current levels, DIY demand to remain at lower levels in the US, and solid organic growth in Mexico. We expect to realize additional benefits from moderating cost inputs and have raised our full-year earnings guidance. We are confident in our future as we mark PPG's 140th anniversary in August. Mizuho Securities Analyst Chris Parkinson inquired, Tim, can you discuss the outlook for industrial coding segment margins in terms of price cost and market mix for the second half of the year? Tim Navish replied, thanks, Chris. I'll let Vince answer the comp accruals, but I'll take segment margins and outlook for some of the businesses. Segment margins in industrial are still recovering. We've seen progress, but there's more work to be done. As far as outlook, we remain cautiously optimistic. Tim Navish replied, Thanks, Chris. Segment margins in industrial have more room to grow, driven by price cost recovery and volume stabilization. We're making progress on operational initiatives which will add to the improvement. Automotive has been resilient, with all major regions up double-digit for Q2. We expect continued strong recovery in auto, lapping a stronger Q3 for China. Packaging is a mix, with pockets of strength in food and beverage, but also pockets of weakness in other areas. We expect this to improve as we move forward. Tim Navish replied, Chris, our auto segment is expected to remain strong in Q3 despite the comp issue with China. We are seeing positive growth in powder for our industrial segment, but other subsegments such as electronic materials, appliance and coax for construction are soft. Packaging has been weak due to destocking and inflation. Overall, we anticipate industrial segment margins to improve. Robert W. Baird and company analyst Ganshan Punjabi inquired, Tim, how has your volume outlook for 2023 changed since the last report? Which businesses are seeing the greatest variability? Are any businesses still being impacted by inventory destocking? Tim Navish replied, destocking is largely behind us and we're seeing a slower than expected recovery in China. In Europe, one-off social and political events in France impacted our volume in Q2. 
DIY markets remain soft, but more than half of our portfolio is resilient and has a positive outlook. Auto, Refinish, Aero, PMC and Mexico are all performing better than anticipated. UBS analyst Josh Spector inquired, what are the drivers behind your 3Q assumption for SG and A as a percent of sales and gross margins? Vince Morales replied, Vince here. On SG and A, we saw higher costs in Q2 compared to the prior year due to performance-based incentive comp, non-cash pension expense, and increased sales. The incentive comp was a catch-up for both Q1 and Q2. For gross profit percent, Q3 is typically a lower volume quarter, so we don't have as much operational pull-through. We do expect improved deflation capture, but the lower volumes will affect our manufacturing efficiency. Deutsche Bank analyst David Begleiter inquired, Tim and Vince, what is the current status of pros backlogs? Are you seeing any signs of weakness? Tim Navish replied, David, pro weakness has been slight, with commercial and maintenance work remaining resilient. We have seen a reduction in backlog. However, painters are having difficulty getting labor, leading to some jobs being passed on. DIY has declined significantly, while pro backlogs have softened slightly. JP Morgan Chase and company analyst Jeffrey Zakowskis inquired, can you discuss the Chinese TO2 industry and the availability of chloride-based material? Are tariffs too high to use in the U.S.? Is 80% of your inventory on FIFO, while most of your U.S. inventory is on LIFO? Does this mean inventory adjustments are needed abroad? Vince Morales replied, Jeff, TO2 oversupply in China is something we are taking advantage of. We have been utilizing Chinese TO2 in Europe, Latin America, and Asia for some time. However, tariffs make it less cost-effective to do so in the U.S. We are still able to capitalize on lower prices by moving TO2 to other markets outside of Asia. John Bruno replied, Jeff, our sales in the U.S. are now 35%. We've acquired several companies in the past five to six years that use the FIFO accounting method, which has caused our inventory to incrementally increase on that basis. Vince Morales replied, apologies for the excess inventory, as John mentioned. We've already reduced our raw material inventory by 50% in the first six months of the year and will continue to work to get back to our historical levels. Bank of America Merrill Lynch analyst Steve Byrne inquired, what is the cost of bras relative to pre-pandemic and how long will it take to flow through COGS? Vince Morales replied, Steve, as we said last quarter, we're seeing mid to high single digit to low double digit deflation on certain raw materials on a year over year basis. This is due to the fact that these raw materials had previously increased by 20 to 40 percent. Although this deflation is being seen on invoices, it typically takes 30 to 90 days for it to flow through. Tim Navish replied, bottom line, Steve, when you combine raw material deflation with the additional inventory we have to work through, I'm confident our margin recovery will continue. BMO Capital Markets Analyst John McNulty inquired, can you provide insight into pricing from 2Q to 3Q and how we should consider it? Tim Davis replied, John, most of the impact we'll see in the remainder of 2023 is carryover from last year. We saw 8% and 6% pricing increases in Q1 and Q2 respectively, and we anticipate low single-digit pricing in Q3. We're still assessing the situation for Q4, but we're confident it will be positive. Vince Morales replied, we anticipate that the price of raw materials will decrease as we reduce our inventories. This should result in deflationary pressure. Tim Davis replied, our pricing has held up well, and our teams have executed well. Our current guide reflects a stronger price story than our prior guides. Morgan Stanley analyst Vincent Andrews inquired, what is the wage inflation outlook for the next few quarters and how much of a headwind is it compared to the raw materials benefits? Tim Davis replied, we're seeing higher than normal wage inflation, averaging around 3% in mature markets and higher in emerging markets. Raw material inflation is still at 20%, but we expect it to decrease to mid to high single digits in Q3. Overall, costs remain elevated compared to pre-pandemic levels, but should improve sequentially as the year progresses. Vince Morales replied, looking at the trend lines, we haven't seen any changes in terms of wage increases or decreases. We implemented our merit process earlier this year, which is typically done annually for most of our employees. This trend should remain consistent for the rest of the year. Goldman Sachs analyst Duffy Fisher inquired, can you explain why the year-over-year -year EPS improvement is expected to decline in the second half of the year compared to the first half, despite the acceleration of raw material deflation and price increases in the back half? Tim Navish replied, Duffy, the biggest factor in the quarter-over-quarter -quarter price changes is the pricing that began in Q3 of last year. As we lap those increases, there is less new pricing adding to the top line. City analyst Patrick Cunningham inquired, what risks should we consider for commercial volumes in the back half of 2021 and 2024 given increasing interest rates? Tim Davis replied, in the short term, we're not worried about the rest of 23 due to the backlog of painting activity that occurred during COVID. Residential painting saw a surge, while commercial and maintenance painting virtually stopped. 
This has created a large amount of pent-up demand in the space. We don't anticipate any major concerns with interest rates or macroeconomic factors in the long run. Barclays analyst Mike Lighthead inquired, what drove the difference between expected and actual sales in 2Q? Tim Navish replied, part of our strong performance in Q2 and Q3 last year was due to compensation-related factors. We are still relatively new to this business and have been learning the market. We experienced a temporary decrease in paint volumes as activities increased, but we anticipate that will be reversed as we move through the rest of the year and into 2021. We have been focused on margin over volume and the team has done an excellent job. While the volumes were lower than expected for the quarter, this business is generating good cash flow and is a positive contributor to the enterprise. Fermium Research Analyst Frank Mitch inquired, what is your opinion on buybacks versus M&A in terms of cash flow use? Are you seeing the right price and timing for these investments? Tim Navish replied, yes, thanks Frank. We're proud of our team for delivering a strong second quarter and getting back to our legacy of strong cash generation. We had previously committed to paying down between 500 to 600 million in debt, and we've already paid 200 million this year. We anticipate having a great cash year, giving us plenty of options. We're not ready to discuss M&A specifics yet, but it remains a priority. We are seeing potential properties come across our desks. Ultimately, we'll use the cash to deliver shareholder value based on what we see at the time. Vince Morales replied, We are committed to paying down our debt and not allowing cash to accumulate on the balance sheet. We made this commitment in May at our New York meeting. KeyBank Capital Markets Analyst Alex Yefremov inquired, What changes have you seen in the U.S. residential construction and infrastructure spending markets in the last three months? Tim Navish replied, On the new build, we are seeing increased activity in new home construction. This is a small part of our business, but it is not insignificant. We have had some successes with new home builders recently. In summary, any new walls that get painted in the US, Mexico, Europe, or Australia is beneficial to us. That would be the first point. What was the second part of your question? Tim Davis replied, thank you for the question. We are seeing an increase in upstream project activity related to US infrastructure. We are actively specifying our products, such as traffic, protective, architectural and industrial coatings, which are typically the last stage of these projects. We are optimistic about the growth opportunities this presents for us in the coming years. Vince Morales replied, We are seeing a surge in nearshoring activity in Mexico, with hundreds of building permits for manufacturing facilities requested. This will bring benefits to us in the next two years, as the manufacturing is put in place. Additionally, our PPG businesses and Comex brand in Mexico will help facilitate painting once industrial activity increases. Tim Navis replied, In Q1 of this year, Mexico saw $48 billion in nearshoring investments, a threefold increase from Q1 of 2022. We are actively involved in the specification side of that business. Seaport Research Partners Analyst Mike Harrison inquired, What pricing trends are you seeing in auto OEM and have there been any customer pushbacks due to raw material declines? Vince Morales replied, Yes, Mike. We've experienced a delay in capturing the inflationary gains due to the time it takes to negotiate with our customers. We are now in a steady state and have not encountered any resistance from our OEM customers. As our volume increases, we are still working to regain our margins. This is a typical lag effect that occurs during an inflation cycle. Tim Navish replied, I would say that overall, market dynamics have been normal and there has been some competitive pressure around the edges. However, nothing material or unexpected has occurred. Credit Suisse analyst John Roberts inquired, what drove the 6% increase in performance segment sales? Was it higher prices or higher volumes? Tim Navish replied, hey, John. Volume in the US was positive, which is our largest and most critical market. It was better than expected. Europe was worse than anticipated, with volume down more than we thought. China's recovery has been slower, resulting in muted volume, but we're seeing it improve sequentially. All in all, it was a great quarter for that business. We're particularly bullish on the US side and monitoring Europe closely. Vince Morales replied, In Europe, we saw some destocking in Q2 with certain refinished customers. We believe this is concluded by the end of the quarter, so we expect demand and volumes to be more in sync in the back half of the year. Wells Fargo Securities Analyst Mike Sison inquired, what is your outlook for the week half of your portfolio in the third quarter? What are your expectations for volume in the fourth quarter? Tim Navish replied, in Q2, architectural Europe was down more than expected, particularly in France. We expect it to start comping close to, or even slightly above, Q3 of last year. In China, the recovery was slower than anticipated, but we believe that any government stimulus in the industrial space will be beneficial for PPG and that China will sequentially improve. Vince Morales replied, Mike, year over year, we're seeing volume challenges in China due to the recovery from COVID shutdowns last year. 
However, we have seen an improvement in volume sequentially from Q2 to Q3. Vertical Research Partners Analyst Kevin McCarthy inquired, Tim, what is your outlook for auto OEM volumes in the back half of the year, particularly in Asia and Europe? What is your view on the medium to long-term outlook for global auto OEM volumes given the current supply deficit of 40 million units? Vince Morales replied, Hey Kevin, this is Vince. China experienced a recovery in auto production in Q3 last year, which skews the year-over-year numbers. I'll let Tim provide more detail. Tim Navish replied, We're seeing positive signs in terms of margin expansion in Q2 and Q3. We've seen raw material costs come down, which has been a major factor in the expansion of our sector margins. Additionally, we've seen an increase in volume in some of the weaker markets, which has also contributed to the expansion of our margins. We expect this trend to continue as long as raw material costs remain low and demand remains steady. Vince Morales replied, We anticipate incremental deflation to flow through our P&L, lapping some pricing. Volume is expected to be the biggest catalyst in 2024, with PPG manufacturing playing a key role. These four elements should have a positive impact on our margins in the back half of the year. Jeffrey's analyst Lawrence Alexander inquired. What is the net impact on earnings and margins from the destocking this year? Vince Morales replied, Lawrence, our invoices are showing mid to high single-digit deflation, while our P&L is experiencing mid-single-digit inflation. We estimate this is resulting in a $0.05 to $0.10 per quarter delay in the impact of these changes being reflected in our financials. John is confirming my math. RBC Capital Markets Analyst Arun Viswanathan inquired, what is the outlook for overall volume growth in the next couple of periods, given the positive trends in aerospace and automotive OEMs and the weakness in packaging and other markets? Tim Navish replied, Arun, I'm optimistic about our 2024 volume outlook. We expect our auto, aerospace, Mexico and refinished businesses to continue to perform well. Additionally, some of our larger businesses are bouncing off the bottom, which should eventually turn into positive growth. In China, recovery has been slower than expected, but any government stimulus could be a positive for us. Lastly, Europe has seen muted volume, but our team has done an excellent job positioning us from a margin and cost-based standpoint, so any uptick in volume there would be beneficial. We'll have more to say on this in our next earnings call. John Bruno replied, Thank you, Carla. We appreciate everyone's interest and confidence in PPG. This concludes our second quarter earnings call. Have a great day.